Hi, Professor Radden. I can see you. Hi, Julia. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. You too. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, Professor Radden, I think you're muted. I don't know if you're unable to mute yourself. If you're... Hi, Catherine. How, how's that? Am I unmuted now? That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Catherine. Long time. Hi, nice you, Catherine. <laughs> oh, yeah, we yes, we have two Catherine's. <laughs> Professor Wells, you're muted as well. You're muted, Catherine. <laughs> oh. Are you are you able to unmute yourself, Catherine? <laughs> There we go. Okay, Peggy, do you know Katie Young? No, very nice to meet you. Hello, hello. I know many of your works, your books and your articles, so it's a real pleasure oh to be goodness. moderating today. In fact, I end my, my class on feminist jurisprudence with your pragmatist and the feminist article. Oh, you like that? I need to mention that with this thing. I really absolutely. Have to... <laughs> I I think I I was imagining it would come up, but yeah, a lot there, to say. the thing is, I, I like that piece, but I haven't seen it in a long time, and I don't have any copies on my computer because it was in the days before I had a computer. Oh, it's I probably have a copy, um, but I think it's excerpted in a lot of American. Um, Probably, textbooks yeah. on feminism yeah, I'll, I'll, and I'll it, yeah <laughs> yeah i just did a quick search and i just saw someone well, um well, use that idea of the double bind with that <laughs> anyway catherine so good to see see you and be moderating today well i, I must say it, it isn't like meeting at the lake but at least we're <laughs> seeing each other's faces katie yeah. does a lot of wonderful work peggy you would certainly enjoy talking with her at some point. Yeah, it's such a shame that we couldn't all get together physically, um, yeah. but Does anybody it would have, have been a very nice dinner after this one, I think. Contracts? What? Contract, do you teach contract? Yes, I yeah. teach contracts. Well, so that's my favorite topic for the last 10 or 12, 10 or 20 years because I started out with property and I thought, well, where does this property end up? <laughs> so I switched to contract. I've been doing contract for a long time. Wow. Yeah, I think your book on boilerplate is fantastic. But I also have excerpts oh for God, that for my contract students. All my books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like it. I don't like Very it much. as well as I used to because I just reread it with a, a student was writing about something about boilerplate and I there was a very interesting case in Canada where the uber drivers sued to be able not to have to go to the Netherlands to do to to get any relief to do um to do um anyway like I a choice of law kind of problem. Of that's, that's, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah no, there's so much um, that it, we're currently thinking. Of. Catherine, I just was rereading the copy that you sent Vlad of your book, and it's so beautifully written. It's, it's, it's too pleasurable it's, to be a, <laughs> a, a law book. Um, it, I just, yeah, Congratulations. It certainly inspires thank good you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. I'm really glad you liked it. So, so, so should I? Could, yeah. I talked to Greg and to um, uh, Scott earlier, and um, they're, they're going to join us in a couple minutes. I told them to come at 5.50, so we'd have a couple minutes to chat. Oh, okay. Did you, did you receive any what is the information? What are other people going to talk about? You probably knew exactly what I would say. Yes, I did, actually. <laughs> I'm sure you did. And it was confirmed in your email, and, and how delightful. Um, <laughs> let 
<laughs> oh, Catherine, I want to ask you a silly question. What's Did that? you go to the AAL, AALS this past winter? Did you go I, to the... No. I saw someone that I thought might be you, and it wasn't you. No, it was not <laughs> I me. I didn't either. run after the poor lady. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not me. <laughs> oh, <too bad. laughs> um, So I'll tell you just briefly what Greg and Scott are going to talk about. Greg, um, he is um, interested in the difference between the common law and constitutional law. Mm -hmm. There is a place in my book where I admit that Holmes's theories of the common law did not serve him well immediately when he went on the Supreme Court. And he, he wants to talk about that in Scalia's uh, book about why we shouldn't use common law decision making. In, um, oh, interest, interesting. Yeah. And then um, Scott, I, his ideas were not quite as well formulated, but I mean, he's working on them now. I'm sure they will be. Um, but he is interested in the process of logical reasoning, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that, um, hi, Greg. We can't hear you. Turn on your volume. You're muted. Catherine, apologies. what's the order? Apologies, my apologies. I, I got confused which which link to use. Hello. Hello. Do you know Peggy Radin? I do Peggy not, Radin. but it's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Gregory. May I call you Gregory? You may, please do. Okay. And you go by Peggy, right? I do, yes. Very nice to meet you. Good to see you, Greg. It, I'm your moderator Katie? today. So I was wondering, it's good Katie. to see you. And you, and nice what? to see you again. So we're going Great to have to some discussions about how the Supreme Court operates and, and where were you in that, in that sentence? Oh, yes, I was telling you, Greg, about um, the subject of your response, which had to do with the difference between common law and constitutional reasoning. I see. Uh -huh. yeah. Are you still on that train? Yeah, I'll be. I, I've I've been assembling some pithinesses from uh, Justice Scalia, so I will I will put them on the into the chat and use them as a building block. Okay. Uh, if that's if if that makes sense to you, Katie, when I give my my comment. Yeah. So if I could just ask quickly, did you establish an order? We hadn't yet because Peggy wasn't with us. Um, I think. Peggy's comment mm -hmm. more general, and Scott's and um, yeah. Greg's are sort of more with the specific parts of the book. So how do you think that would work, Katie? What? Well, maybe if, perhaps if Peggy goes first after you give your presentation, Catherine. Okay. No, I will And go then we go into the more specifics. <laughs> and I have is just a summary of, of his life and what I think is important about him. So that's probably a good way to start. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And would you like me to introduce everybody in the beginning or would you like me to introduce you each in turn? Any preference? I think in turn is better. It helps people yep. know who's talking, especially on Zoom. Yeah, sure. Although we do okay. have our names. Now we're only missing yeah. Scott. He's cutting. But it's such a distinguished panel. I will spend a, a, bit, a tiny bit of time introducing you each then before the next person speaks. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. And hi, I'm Julia, by the way, for those of you who, hi, I, ha who I haven't had. I have seen you. You were hard on when I was going to come last year. And yes, you know, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it, I, I was so sad we had to cancel the in-person event last year. Yeah, but so uh, yeah. I would have loved the it. The call center is Zoom tech now. <laughs> so if you have any questions about the technology, um, yeah. I'll be here in the background the whole time. Um, we're recording the event as well, just so you know. I think is perhaps the reason I couldn't get in is because I'm sitting here in Canada, you know. Yeah, that could be I it. I didn't have a number to call from Canada, I guess. I don't know what mm -hmm. happened, but anyway. Everyone's audio and visual sounds good right now, though, so. Good. Are we concerned about Scott? Yeah, I'm a little concerned. Do we Let think you may not have the like right uh, link? Yeah, let me resend him the link. Julia, will we all see the Q&A or will I just be seeing that Q&A? You will all see the Q&A. 
Um, attendees are not able to chat, but we can chat with each other and to the attendees. Um, and then they can ask questions through the Q&A oh. box. Oh, so that was my quote. So can I put quotes directly into the chat? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just You'll That's just make sure you're sending it to all attendees and it'll be all set to go. So we have closed captioning as well. Julia, um, Scott had wanted to share a kind of handout for his presentation. Mm -hmm. So I think he'll want to email that to you. And then you is there a way for you to share a document that way? He can share it himself, actually. If there's Scott now, I can make him a co-host and he can share his own screen. Sometimes okay, I find that's know. better. He just so showed no up, lag. so let him know. Did, did you, to... hi. Did, did you see the link that I sent? Are you able to, it, it should be a link that you can put in a chat. Oh, he's there, good. I just emailed you, Scott. Did you want to um, share your screen, Scott? No, or was there just a... I, I wanted to put it in the chat so that people could have it on their own computers rather than have me control what's on the screen. I, okay, I that, yeah. That's easier, that's the way I do it in my classes. If you have a link, you can just copy paste it into the chat and you're able to share it with all the attendees. Okay, let's see. Once we go live, we're in practice mode right now. So we'll wait a few minutes to broadcast. Who is Sherry Car Captioner? Oh, she's our closed, she's our closed captioner. So oh, our, yeah. our audience is able to have that available in case. <laughs> well, can I try putting this in the chat now so you can see that it works? Yeah. Um, okay, so. Greg, do you want to go before Scott or after? Yeah, I received I, the link, Scott. I am fine. I mean, it's up to you. I will be making this larger sort of 30,000 foot question through Scalia about the role of yeah. common law thinking in constitutional jurisprudence. So. Sounds like an ending to me. Okay. My, mine, is, mine is about 5,000 feet. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> Okay, so, so the order would be so, Catherine, Peggy, Scott, Greg. Yes, I think that works for you. And nobody and needs around to share their screen. Excuse me? Nobody needs to share their screen for any reason. I don't. Okay. Well, I don't know. You will be able to post things in the chat. Are you able to open that document, uh, Julia, for example? I mean, yes. Okay. Good. So, Julia, my notes are on my computer, so I'm going to read them, um, which doesn't interfere with the camera, right? It does not. No. Well, I should no. be fine. If there's some problem, let me know, and I will stop doing that. But I will. I'll send you a chat. But everything looks good now. So, um, were there any other? Can you each have between ten and ten and fifteen minutes? Fifteen minutes. I'll really push you to end, but um, just because there, we would like to leave some time for Q&A. So 10 minutes is better than 15, just. And wrap up by you. like seven o'clock? <clears throat> yeah, by seven o'clock. Okay. OK. With Zoom, you can't use physical restraint. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think there are other obnoxious things to do though. <laughs> well, I've nudged a few people in my time, so. <laughs> um, on that note, we are ready to go live if everyone else is. Sure. Yeah, awesome. If you want to just, after I start broadcasting, Katie, if you want to just let the viewers know that we're going to wait a minute or two just for the numbers to start coming up, and then you can start speaking. OK. Awesome. All right, I'm going to disappear now, but I'll be in the back. <laughs> Good to see you, Julia. So welcome everyone to the Clow Center for Constitutional Democracy. Uh, we're hosting our next author meets critic panel. This is a fantastic and distinguished panel and we'll be discussing today Catherine Wells's most recent book on Oliver Wendell Holmes, The Willing Servant of an Unknown God. This has just been published late 2019 by Cambridge University Press. We're actually gonna wait a couple of minutes to get started as the Zoom is populating. So I'm just here uh, to initiate the, the link. My name is Katie Young. I'm a professor here at Boston College 
a long and happy colleague of Catherine Wells, um, who has been a wonderful contributor to the uh, pragmatist spirit and the spirit of wisdom on, on the Boston College Law Campus for many years. So it's my great pleasure to be moderating this particular Author Meets Critic panel tonight. I welcome all of our participants. I want to remind all participants that this is being recorded. Uh, the questions and answers are uh, able to be accessed through that small tab on, on the Zoom screen. Uh, and you can insert your Q&A there. If there's time in the, at the end of the panel, we will be trying to cover as many Q&As, uh, as many Qs with As as we can. Um, so now I think I can get started in introducing our panel uh, very briefly, and I'll turn to introduce the speakers with a bit more uh, substance uh, before each of them speak tonight. So as I mentioned, my name's Katie Young. I'm here at Boston College welcoming this panel on Professor Wells's book. I'm here joined by an illustrious group of panelists uh, and I'll just list them in order before I introduce them with more substance. I'm joined by Professor Margaret Jane Radden from the University of Toronto, Professor Scott Brewer from the Harvard Law School, Professor Greg Freed from here, uh, Boston College Philosophy Department. And we're here um, also um, with, with Catherine to, to talk about her book. Um, so let me start with a very brief introduction to Catherine Wells, who, as I've mentioned, has been a long and wonderful colleague here at Boston College Law School um, with a great association too with the Klaus Center for Constitutional Democracy. Uh, uh, Catherine Wells is a both a professor of law and a law school fund research scholar at Boston College Law School, and she is a nationally recognized expert on pragmatism and its relation to American legal theory. Uh, she has published a number of extraordinarily important articles on Oliver Wendell Holmes, and she has weaved those insights with um, some, some more astonishing work um, on both his intellectual biography and his an intellectual history of pragmatism and what he brings to that. Um, the book itself is extraordinarily pleasurable to read. Uh, it is so deft in dealing with the heights of pragmatism and the complexities, uh, and it has really brought so much wisdom to the topic. So I really commend the book. If we were able to have a physical panel, there would be a display of books for you all to see and leaf through. And I really regret that we couldn't uh, meet physically together as planned, but it is so wonderful to be on Zoom and to be able to meet with you all tonight. Um, so let me um, open up. Each of our speakers will speak very briefly. And we've invited uh, Catherine Wells first to speak about Oliver Wendell Holmes, both uh, his life and what he brings to our study of law and uh, our study of philosophy. So Catherine, if you would like to begin. Sure. Thank you, Katie, so much for that very kind introduction. And thank you to the Klaus Center, <clears throat> who generously offered to support this panel. Um, thanks to Greg and Scott for agreeing to engage with my work and a very special thanks to Peggy, who has always been an inspiration to me. I'd like to begin by saying that this book took many years of thought and research. I kept working at it because I thought that Holmes had something important to teach us, not just about law, but about the nature of life itself. Holmes's story is well known. At the age of 20, he enlisted in the Union Army. In three years, he was wounded three times. The conditions were miserable. For weeks at a time, he lived in the cold and wet without benefit of tents or changes of clothes. He had a nearly fatal bout of dysentery. And worst of all, he felt the loss of hundreds of friends and comrades. Mm -hmm. On his return, he toyed briefly with becoming a poet or a philosopher, but he finally settled on a career in law. As a law student, he excelled. He not only mastered the required texts, but also read widely in legal history and legal theory. Even in practice, he continued his studies. And with his friends, Henry Ropes and John Gray, he founded the Harvard Law Review. By 1880, he was well qualified to accept a position at Harvard Law School and to deliver a prestigious series of lectures that would become the common law. 
1882, at the age of 40, he began his judicial career on the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. 20 years later, Teddy Roosevelt appointed him to the Supreme Court. There he served for 30 years, retiring at the age of 92. By the time of his death, he had become famous. Like Justice Ginsburg, he was an icon of popular culture. He was the subject of many books, magazine features, a Broadway play, and even a general release motion picture. The public saw him as the Yankee from Olympus, standing for the triumph of American values over the creeping mediocrity of the industrial age. All of this changed, however, with the Second World War. Holmes became a controversial figure. His detractors argued that he, like so many war veterans, had been psychologically damaged by military service. They painted him as cold and distant and argued that he was handicapped as a judge due to his inability to empathize with others. But not everyone agreed. Holmes still has many admirers who think of him as a fitting ideal for American law. So what does such a man teach us about law? The first and most important thing is that law is connected to life. Law is organic. It is not derived from abstract logical systems or divine decrees. Rather, it arises from human need, from the culture and traditions of a people. While it's true that judges must weave their decisions into the complex fabric of legal reasoning, a judge who does only this misses the point. Ultimately, every judicial decision must be evaluated by its practical tendency to facilitate human endeavors. Second, the law should not be mysterious and hard to fathom. Holmes's opinions are well known for their brevity and pithiness. Some commentators criticize this, arguing that a more extended discussion of the cases would provide better guidance for the future. But Holmes believed in candor. His opinions clearly describe the reasons why he decided the case in the way that he did. Oh, Not necessarily in terms of legal doctrine, but in practical terms. This kind of transparency, he thought, created accountability and integrity. Third, it goes without saying that Holmes believed in the complete independence of the judiciary. In deciding cases, he paid no attention to politics. If the president or the governor or his social peers would be disgruntled, he could not let this change his course. Fourth, and this to me is his central insight, he viewed adjudication as a social practice, one that had a long and distinguished history. Reading the common law, one sees judging in a different light. Things that you would not notice in 50 years of case law become much more apparent in the long view. The relationship between law and social need becomes more obvious. One can also see the unstated norms that govern legal practices. The common law connects us to centuries of our history and deepens our understanding of who we are as lawyers and the nature of the path that we follow. So much for law, what about life? On this front, Holmes found himself in a bit of a paradox. On the one hand, he was descended from the Calvinist set settlers of Boston and had inherited their sense of duty and devotion. On the other hand, he was agnostic. He believed in a transcendent power that organized the universe and decreed its fate. But he also believed that this power, whatever it was, was not knowable. <laughs> We lived in its shadow, but we could not see its face. Thus he was, as my title states, a servant of an unknown God. There was something of the postmodern in his predicament. I always feel when I read home that he speaks to my generation rather than his own. Gone are the long explanations of how we know what we know. Instead, we consider our ignorance asking the question, how do we act when our knowledge is partial and uncertain? Holmes, I think, provides us with one answer to this question. 
During the Civil War, Holmes learned to live by the soldier's faith. Soldiers, he knew, were cogs in the wheel of a great war machine. Their duty was defined by the orders they were issued. They were expected to give their all, sometimes even their lives, for an objective that was unknown to them. They had to have faith that there was a larger plan that made their sacrifice worthwhile. This was the paradigm he carried with him into civilian life. So how did the soldier's faith motivate him in civilian life? The answer is that he felt himself to be a part of the universe, a cog in the vast machinery of existence. This was not an abstract conviction. Like Emerson, he felt the mystery and magic of the universe all around him. And more importantly, he felt himself to be a part, indeed a very small part, of that magical force. And it was in this feeling that he found the meaning of his life. Meaning came, he thought, not from a pretense of power, but performing the role he had been assigned with conviction and commitment. It was participation rather than the pretense of power that made life meaningful. Thus, for example, in The Path of the Law, he tells law students that through studying law, they can become not only, quote, a great master in their calling, but also they can, quote, connect themselves with the universe by catching an echo of the infant, a, a glimpse of its unfathomable process, a hint of the universal law. Holmes was fond of quoting Ecclesiastes. The verse is as follow. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Holmes had an ardent spirit and energy to spare. He must have welcomed this advice. But it was not simply a matter of temperament. It was also a matter of conviction. Regarding earthly achievement as unreal, he believed in an encompassing reality beyond the physical realm where his heroic actions would meet a proper response. This was the touchstone of his life, the image he remembered in times of struggle and doubt. Thank you very much uh, for that description, Catherine. And I think, uh, the analogy you you start out with Catherine with Justice Ginsburg is a very good one. Um, another one of uh, the iconic justices in which there's a cartoonish kind of rendering that that is easy to to digest but doesn't shed light on all of the complexities and contradictions. I think your book, what it does with Oliver Wendell Holmes, who exists for us, you know, for every law student, uh, is so important. Uh, so let me now turn to our second speaker, uh, the first commentator of the book, and, and introduce Professor Radin. So Professor Margaret Jane Radin, or Peggy Radin, um, is an extraordinary expert in uh, many fields that touch on, on Holmes's uh, work and wisdom, including legal pragmatism and um, bringing uh, pragmatist insights to feminism. Um, she's the Henry King Ransom Professor of Law Emer Emirata at the University of Michigan Law School, and is also a professor of law at the University of Toronto and is the author of many award-winning books, um, of books of contract law and property law, uh, legal theory and political philosophy. And her most recent book, um, which many people like myself who teach contracts would know, is a, her 2013 book by Princeton University Press on boiler, boiler plate, uh, the fine print, vanishing rights and the rule of law. So without further ado, let me ask uh, Professor Radin for her comments on uh, Professor Wells's book. Thank you, Professor Young, for the nice comments. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Professor Wells is the, is the spring roar of my interest in pragmatism and philosophy, and, and she persuaded me to read the books. At the University of Southern California, where we both worked once upon a time long ago, the Law Review decided to, to let us have a, a larger issue based upon <coughs> pragmatism. 
And I learned that if you invite the, the most famous bigwig, the other bigwigs will come. <laughs> so the, the conference was great. <coughs> and it, it created a book of, of essays that, that um, were put into the, that, they were put into the lower U there. And um, I was particularly interested in pragmatism in, in those days, thanks to, thanks to Professor Wells. And I was particularly interested in something I called the problem of a double bind. Why is it that we used to think, everybody thought women can't do men's work. So, okay, how we're gonna change what things are gonna work for women. And it, it was very well located for feminism. So what, what does Well say about pragmatism in Holmes's time? I didn't study philosophy. I wish I had, <laughs> but I've always liked it. So it seems that what Well says about pragmatism in Holmes's time, and he, he knew many of the famous people there are deeply held beliefs that, that we can't say otherwise. We know what this means and we can't say otherwise. And the question there is how do we ever move on from such deeply held beliefs? How did we move on to women being able to work? Women are on the Supreme Court. I know that Holmes did not see that coming. <laughs> So how did we how do we move on from that? How do we move on from believing that I believe Professor Wells says that he Holmes thought that deeply held beliefs are the things that you that you cannot you cannot fail to recognize when you hear the word. So there's skin color and gender and the role of wife and women and, and independence. There's all kinds of things that we later got excited about. And I wonder how, if you wanna be a pragmatist, which I do want to do, I wonder how you do that. And I thought of something which I, I did write something called the pragmatist and the feminist and I began to think that there's something that we have to call a double bind. You say, well, but women can't do men's work, so we can't pay them as much, but we have to show that women can do all the work that lawyers do. Women can do all the work that lots of men can do, and men can't do some of the work that is thought to be male, etc. So work doesn't have gender really, but, but we call, I called that a double bind. It was a bind in that, in that women can't do it and are not allowed to do it. And also we don't get to help women know how to do it. And the question that, en they end up with, that I end up with is how do we come to understand that the future can be different than what we see now? Because if we believe what Holmes thought, Holmes thought if we believe he thought what anything means is what everybody would believe what what everybody says about it right and if he believes that about eugenics which apparently he did and i'm going to tell you another story now here's a here's a story once upon a time when i was teaching at michigan the the people there the teachers there the deans there wanted to get the students more involved in thinking about things so we decided to have seminars in the teachers' homes. And, and my seminar is going to be the 10 worst Supreme Court decisions of all time. And you, you can say Dred Scott and Plessy and, and you can say Bowers and Hardwick but I, and Lochner too, but I wanted to say Buck B. Bell. I always wanted to. And, that, and then I added Kuramatsu and I finally added Bush v. Gore. What could be worse for our constitution? So, so needless to say, my fellow colleagues didn't agree with me about my list. 
and I think that I think that the that that seminar never came off. But um, Buck versus Bell apparently had great influence. If you if and um, Professor Wells quoted other other books of the that were about eugenics in America, and she didn't hide it. Thousands of people were thousands of women were hurt by that, and even the people in Hitler's crowd wanted to know about American eugenics. So, so it was a sad thing to have happen. So I don't want pragmatism to be inherently conservative. Mm. Um, I think that's like Dworkin's view of law. We just look at what's always been and we try and pull from that. I want connection with language for sure, but I don't want that view of law and I don't want pragmatism to be like that. We have these days in, in the USA, we have very scary words like socialism. And most things are social if, they're, if they have to be done for the, for the whole group. So that is, that is social. But I'm hoping that the day will come when I see a quote person of color and I see a person that I don't see what color they are. I would like that day to come. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Professor Aiden. And so let me now turn uh, to our next speaker, Professor Scott Brewer, who is a professor of law at Harvard Law School. Uh, and there he writes and teaches about legal theory, about the nature and uses of arguments about contract law and the law of evidence, also about politics and everyday life. Um, amongst other things, uh, Professor Brewer is a founder and administrator of the Logocratic Academy, which I noted uh, recently, um, uh, also published in uh, a field of artific artificial intelligence and the law, incredibly interesting field two for um, the nature of argument. And so let me, um, without further ado, now turn to Professor Brewer for his uh, comments on, on this book. Great, thank you very much, uh, Katie. And uh, Catherine, thank you for inviting me here. I'm delighted to um, uh, be thinking about pragmatism again with you. I was at that conference in Southern California, uh, uh, really? Southern California. <laughs> Uh, low those many years ago, um, and I've been learning about pragmatism, including from you, for many years. And um, let me just say, I, I'm hoping that people have access to the talking notes that I put. I put a link in the chat, so I'm hope um, people should be able to, or maybe that had to be recent. Um, <laughs> did that happen? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so th those are talking notes in case anybody wants to uh, follow along with what I'm saying. Uh, I'll just begin by saying I loved this book. I loved its sense of historical narrative and detail, um, which it related without, without ever getting bogged down. I loved its contributions to a field of jurisprudence that I have called the jurisprudence of logical form, which is uh, the study of the explanatory role um, in jurisprudence and thinking about law and the nature of law and legal institutions, uh, what role does the representation of legal arguments make to jurisprudence? That's what I call the jurisprudence of logical form. And Catherine's book, uh, among other things, does a beautiful job of laying out issues related to the jurisprudence of logical form in general and to Holmes's contributions to the jurisprudence of logical form in particular. Now, one of the many reasons I'm grateful to have been invited to comment on this book is the opportunity it gives me to revisit and if necessary, revise or correct a view about Holmes's understanding of logic that I articulated in a couple of articles uh, a while ago. Uh, one article was on Holmes's path of the law. The other one was on both Holmes and Dewey. Uh, Dewey's attempt to explain from a philosophical point of view the, the uh, assertion that, that Holmes makes in the Lochner dissent that general propositions do not decide concrete cases. Um, having revisited this issue in light of Catherine's superb book, my conclusion is that 
uh, Catherine's rich analysis of Holmes's understanding of legal reasoning and his related practice with the use of the term logic has not altered my understanding of Holmes, but instead has richly informed my view of Holmes on logic. Um, and I still think that Holmes has not had a good influence um, on the way logic is understood in legal education, particularly and uh, the understanding of the way logic uh, and argument play a role in the development and application of law more generally. Um, put slightly more confrontationally, after learning a great deal from Catherine Super, a superb book, I still believe that Holmes is framing the issue of the role of law, <clears throat> a role in law of what he referred to as logic with his typical and considerable stylistic fluidity has been one of his most important contributions to the jurisprudence of logical form, but that his views were either too unclearly expressed, too insensitive to important distinctions, or too inadequately supported by accurate conceptual and descriptive analysis of the nature of argument and logic to be a useful guide for understanding the reasons and reasonings of law. Now, those are large claims. I can't lay them out in, in, in full detail here, obviously. But if you're following along on my, on the uh, on my discussion notes, I'll, I'll sort of sketch my, my view about this. So we can begin by asking, how did, law, how did Holmes understand the term logic? What was he referring to? And the path of the law gives a good starting point, along with his review of Langdell, along with his uh, uh, common law tradition. Uh, both, all, all of this is discussed uh, very nicely in, in Catherine's book. What I see when I read um, the path of the law, for example, is that Holmes used the term logic in five distinct senses without, it seems to me, a clear understanding of the ways in which th these senses were importantly different. Um, so he, um, uh, if, you're, if you're following along on the bottom of the first page of, of the discussion notes, one is logic is a set of roughly synonymous terms, including sensible, reasonable, warranted. Um, I've given a few examples there. Another is logic as a syllogistic or another type of deductive inference. Um, for example, um, and this is, this is, this is, this really, this understanding of logic really seemed to dominate his, both his understanding of what logic was and the role of logic in law. And that, um, that sort of emphasis on this one logical form, I think really distorted his understanding of logic um, uh, in important ways. Uh, another term of, uh, another, another uh, sense of logic is logic as a deductive system with axioms, rules of inference, theorems as in geometry. Another is as a rationally discernible pattern of cause and effect. And yet another is a set of argument types, individually invariant, but distinct from one another. Um, the training of lawyers is a training in logic. The processes of analogy, discrimination, and deduction uh, is what he's referring to here. Now, I think that the senses one and two are seem to me un un unproblematic, but three and four seem to be very problematic because his critique that has become famous in, this, in the uh, assertion that we hear from time to time, uh, Barack Obama used it when he, uh, when he was standing at the appointment ceremony for Justice Sotomayor, you know, the life of the law has not been logic, it's been experience. Um, that in influential idea conflates a, a mistaken view about the nature of legal language, which HLA Hart calls conceptualism or formalism, with the, the idea of logic itself. So his fifth sense is most promising. Um, and that's the kind of, I, I take up the study of logic in multiple forms, including but not limited to deduction as a more promising way to explain the nature of legal argument and the operation of logic in, 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 in law. So um, I, I'll skip ahead to um, a, a, a better starting point for understanding logic, in my view, I'm on page five now of my discussion notes, is in what I call the logocratic method, or it's a, it's a type of explanation of argument. 
according to which there are four modes of logical inference, deduction, induction, abduction, and analogy. Um, each of them has what I call a characteristic virtue, that is to say a property that makes it a good argument of its type. So the easiest one to understand is a deduction uh, in which, uh, which is reasoning in which the truth of the premises of the argument provide incorrigible evidence of the truth of the conclusion. The, the virtues of the other three modes of inference, induction, abduction, and analogy are, are more complex to state. I will note though that, that Charles Peirce, who was um, Holmes' sometime discussion partner in the metaphysical club uh, in, a, in a beautiful discussion by, uh, that Catherine offers, was the sort of emphasizer, either discoverer or rediscoverer, it may have been an Aristotle already, of the mode of abduction. And abduction is extremely important because it's the basic mode of inference to an explanation of a set of facts from a legal point of view. And I'd sort of give definitions of all of those ideas uh, in, in when, I, when, I, in, in, you know, when we teach the logocratic method in detail. Okay, now, um, what I want to say is the question that I have for Catherine is uh, in, in her understanding of Holmes and, and Holmes's understanding of logic and the role of argument in, the role of logic in legal argument is whether there is not more stability in legal argument than her model of Holmes as wrestling with the paradox of form and substance might indicate. And what I have in mind by this greater stability, it could be something that's called a political morality, or it could be an ideology. I mean, there are different terms, some, some, some more condemnatory than others for this. But when I teach contracts, for example, I see a competition of views that is a kind of stable competition. So if you're on um, page six toward the bottom of my discussion notes, one, um, the distinction between classical and romantic theories of contract is understood as an answer to three overlapping overarching questions, autonomy versus heteronomy, whose judgment of preference policy or principle is to be given effect? Is it the parties, the trial court, the appellate court, the legislature? What about the fact of unequal capacities? Should a judge do anything about that? And if so, what? And the allocation of risk. Should a, when and under what circumstances should a judge intervene to reallocate risk that the parties have seemed to uh, take on to themselves? The classical and romantic are systematically distinct answers to those different questions. And if you go to page eight, I've sort of tabularized the the, the, that, the, the systematic differences there. So the classical tends to have a laissez-faire kind of political economy as opposed to the romantic communitarian. Classical is anti-paternalistic as opposed to the romantic paternalistic. Um, man is an island under the classical view. Every man is his brother's keeper to some extent on the romantic view. Very, very important. The judicial role on the classical view is understood that the judge is a neutral referee, whereas the judicial role in the romantic view is the judge as a roving fair, fair, fairness and field leveling commissioner. The dominant reason for enforcing uh, promises under the classical view is that it's part of a bargain for exchange represented in restatement section, uh, the, the restatement rule on consideration, as opposed to the restatement rule on promissory estoppel. Now, what I say and what I see when I teach contracts is that these two views, classical and romantic, are being sort of played at and tugged at and, and sort of combated by judges in majority opinions and dissenting opinions over and over and over again. And if you're on page nine, you can see that there are rule playing options for argument. So a romantic judge can interpret a rule adopted to serve classical norms narrowly, interpret a rule adopted to serve romantic norms broadly, um, or adopt a romantic rule. A classical judge can do basically the counterpart, interpret a rule uh, adopted to serve classical norms broadly, interpret a rule uh, to serve, uh, adopted to serve romantic norms narrowly, such as section 90, or adopt a classical rule. A great example of this is a famous pair of cases that you teach and that one, one typically teaches in contracts, the James Baird and Gim Gimbel case decided by Learned Hand, representing the classical idea and Drennan versus Star Paving, 
decided by Roger Traynor in the California Supreme Court representing the romantic view. There's a common fact pattern in these two kinds of cases um, in which a subcontractor makes an offer to a general contractor. The general contractor, instead of accepting or even conditionally accepting a point that, that Hand uh, emphasizes, um, the offer from the subcontractor simply uses the bid figure from the subcontractor to bid for the general contract then gets the general contract, having relied on the subcontractor's bid figure, seeks at that point and only at that point formally to accept, only to have the subcontractor revoke the promise or seem to revoke the promise. And the question is, what, what is the best explanation of that kind of fact pattern from a legal point of view, which is the question of legal abduction? If you go further down on the page um, nine, you can see, I've kind of again, uh, nine over to 10, I won't go through all the details, but there are five distinct possible legal explanations for this fact pattern, which each, which both hand and and trainer consider, and they, you know, the, uh, trainer rejects all of them except one, which is that he's going to analogize his circumstances of sub subcontractor and general contractor to. Um, promissory estoppel, and in fact, in the restatement, a new rule was sort of codified, section 87, as a counterpart of section 90, whereas Hand uses reasoning by disanalogy to distinguish the subcontractor general contractor case from cases in which in New York State they had applied promissory estoppel, and he says it basically doesn't have any role when parties are trying to make a bargain. The, the summary of the point is that these judges are motivated by understandable, coherent patterns of views that include views about what contract is for, how parties ought to behave in, with, toward each other in, when they make contracts, and very importantly, what the proper judicial role is for a judge in adjudicating contracts disputes. These are stable, com competing ideas of law, and they use all four modes of legal reasoning to serve the interests of that understanding of law. That's not a kind of uh, a, a unstable, paradoxical, confusing thing. It's the, it's the development of an idea about what, about what say contract law is for and what a, a contract law judge ought to do. And then they compete, they advance that, they use various modes of argument to advance that idea. So my, my question then is, how does Catherine see Holmes's understanding of this kind of clash, which I'm calling the, cla the, the classical and romantic, it can be extended pretty without too much trouble from contracts to torts, property, and other uh, private law, so-called private law areas. But I also think that you know, competing political moralities or ideologies are also clearly present at the Supreme Court, which is why we continue to have so much energy and attention paid to who's on the Supreme Court and what is their so-called judicial philosophy. So how does Catherine understand the use, the Holmes's understanding, it's a meta understanding, how does Catherine understand Holmes's understanding of logic and the use of legal argument to serve particular um, political, moral, or ideological purposes? Um, that's what I wanted to raise and uh, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Professor Brewer. I'm going to step in as my role as moderator. I'm gonna suspend that question till the very end uh, and let us first hear from Professor Freed. He might also be posing a question to you and you can collect them all together um, and we'll have a chance to hear your answer then, Professor Wells. So let me introduce Professor Freed a professor of philosophy here at Boston College, another good friend of the Klaus Center for Constitutional Democracy uh, and of the great connections between the law school and the philosophy department. He teaches and publishes in political philosophy and he has a particular interest in the responses to the challenges uh, that we are seeing with uh, challenges to liberal democracy and the rise of ethno-nationalism. He has also published several books on Heidegger uh, and his forthcoming book uh, is on this subject. It is titled Towards a Polemical Ethics Between Heidegger and Plato. Uh, so again, I'm expecting a um, very uh, specialized set of analyses and I'll turn the floor over to you, Professor Freed, for your comments on the book. Oh, 
Sorry, I have to unmute myself. My apologies. Thank you so much, Katie. And I'm really delighted to be here uh, at the Close Center to be able to speak about Catherine's wonderful book, which I, I can't agree more with the other speakers who, who praise, it, as you called it, Katie, it's deftness in portraying uh, not just uh, uh, Holmes the jurist, but Holmes the man and Holmes the thinker and Holmes, above all, I think Catherine, Holmes the human being. I think your book is extraordinarily humane and that it's a great talent to be able to do that while also sifting the philosophical and legal history that allows us to have this full picture of Holmes the man. And, and so it's a, it's a tour de force in a, in a delicious package. So thank you for allowing us this opportunity. I, I wanted to speak, I had said before when we had met at the sort of 30,000 foot level, um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm most interested in questions in political philosophy as they relate to legal hermeneutics, uh, which I can pretend to understand without being a trained lawyer. So um, I, want to, I want to start first with Holmes's pragmatism in legal hermeneutics and then move on to make this as current as possible by taking Anton Scalia as, a, an, an, as an antagonist to Holmes and Holmes's reliance on the common law tradition for his jurisprudence. So uh, in your book, you quote Holmes from the Lochner, his Lochner decision. I'm gonna put this up in the chat for everybody. So um, let's see. All, I need all panelists and attendees. I think this will work. Um, so I'm sorry, it doesn't come out very well here, but here the language is, I think that the word liberty in the 14th amendment is perverted when it is held to prevent the natural outcome of a dominant opinion, unless it can be said that a rational and fair man necessarily would admit that the statute proposed would infringe fundamental principles as they have been understood by the traditions of our people and the law. So that, uh, I was just preparing my remarks and that really blazed out to me because as I understood your presentation of his overall life and the role of pragmatism in his philosophy, uh, he has a very specific way of understanding how to make sense of words like liberty in the 14th Amendment. And to me in your presentation, there's an almost tragic trajectory in, in Holmes's life from serving as a soldier in the Civil War filled with a certain kind of idealism to being unable to enforce the uh, post-Civil War amendments in an effective way to pr protect the rights of African Americans. So in that sentence, what I really want to zero in in is those principles and understandings and traditions of our people and our law. So first of all, to think ahead to Scalia, are those things extraneous to the text itself of the law? referring to such principles and traditions of our people and our law. And also, I think that this expression here is what separates Holmes from contemporary proponents of the living constitution or idealist readings of the constitution because uh, his pragmatism prevents him, Holmes, from ascribing overarching political ethical principles to inform constitutional interpretation. Instead, he falls back onto, or indeed smuggles in, I would say, a quasi Hobbesian moral political philosophy that the law serves. And that 
is to prevent or tamp down conflict, violence, and the war of all against all by wielding the state monopoly on power to overawe the citizenry. So Holmes's pragmatism had convinced him that there was no fundamental transcendent truth about ethics and political philosophy. So what I mean by him smuggling in a, an overarching political philosophy is that he turns to this quasi Hobbesian sense. And that quasi Hobbesian sense leads to his uh, non-textualism of importing principles, understandings and traditions that are a kind of Burkean conservatism rather than uh, an idealism about what the constitution means. So let me use Scalia to attack Holmes even further in terms of making use of the common law tradition. So Scalia attacks the common law tradition in constitutional interpretation in his wonderful essay, Common Law Courts in a Civil Law System. He thinks that uh, there has been a tremendous and pernicious effect that has been the result of injecting common law jurisprudence onto a constitutional and civil law system. So Scalia says that he and those like him, I'm gonna put this in the, in the, in the chat as well, uh, I'm sorry if that work didn't work. Um, I, I think it may not have worked. Sorry. Did it? We look for a sort of objectified intent, the intent that a reasonable person would gather from the text of the law placed alongside the remainder of the corpus juris. And what he means by that is this. Excuse me. And the reason we adopt this objectified version is I think that it is simply incompatible with democratic government or indeed even with a fair government to have the meaning of a law determined by what the lawgiver meant rather than what the lawgiver promulgated. So that's why Scalia claims that his form of textualism is not to look to the intent of the law on the one hand and certainly not to traditions and principles extraneous to the written law, uh, but rather to the objective public meaning of the text as it was understood at the time, because that's what the democratic representatives of the people had passed as the text of the law. And there can be no other sovereign authority in a democratic republic than the people speaking through its legislature in the text of the law as it was understood objectively at that time. So what the common law tradition as imported into constitutional jurisprudence does is that it gives authority to the justice to import principles, understandings, traditions that are extraneous to the democratically promulgated law that are in the end up to the judge's whim. And the judge has no authorization to do that. So I think on the one hand, he would critique Holmes for thinking that the common law serves as a basis at all but furthermore, I think Holmes's own inadequacies in the pragmatic approach that led him to this surreptitious Hobbesianism uh, weren't, uh, didn't go far enough, but Scalia's contemporary attack is, but they're out of bounds altogether. I'll leave it at that <laughs> and we'll go on to conversation. Well, let me um, invite you, 
Professor Wells to answer those, but let me add a couple of questions from the Q&A. Since we only have 10 minutes left, we're going to end at seven, and then perhaps you can weave your answers to these as well. Um, we've had two questions from the audience. The first is from our colleague, uh, Professor Dan Cocolet, and he is commending you on such a terrific book, readable but subtle, which I would really agree uh, with. Uh, and he notes that Holmes has been severely criticized by natural law advocates such as Robbie George, who've based their criticism largely on the essay that Holmes wrote entitled Natural Law. And the primary charge is that Holmes did not believe in a loving God and was a Unitarian because, quote, it was the least we could be. What do you think, Professor Wells, about this criticism and uh, this uh, portrayal of Holmes? Um, another anonymous attendee has uh, also agreed that to read Holmes today is to read someone who seems very current, almost postmodern. Um, would Holmes have any helpful insights about the epistemic fragmentation that we are experiencing today? And the uh, questioner says that she or he means this not only um, because of the current disagreement about first principles among members of the judiciary, but also more generally what we're seeing amongst the American public. And finally, a question, if I just can add this, that popped up regarding, and this is from Professor Garcia, uh, another colleague, um, regarding the view that judging is a social practice, how would Holmes go about understanding the social in question in a time when constitutional and other opinions are migrating transnationally and when international courts speak to a transnational audience, really noting that the influence of Holmes and the ideas of legal pragmatism are not just American in scope. Okay, I leave it to you, Professor Wells, and I'm going to um, end at seven. So you have about eight minutes to answer a, a trove of questions. Okay, well, um, I've heard a lot of smart things, and I'm obviously not going to be able to respond to all of them. But I, I do hear a theme. Um, and um, the theme, it has, all right, so pragmatists see um, every human activity as a practice and as a practice that is embedded with certain ideas, understandings, beliefs, context, all that sort of thing. And um, there, there are a lot of questions you can ask about this way of looking at the law. Um, Peggy's question, I think, is right on point, which is if you have, if you look at it that way, isn't pragmatism inherently conservative? Aren't people inherently bound and unable to think around their con context? And I think there are a couple answers to that. From the point of view of someone who is embedded in the context, that is, if you're thinking about gender from a male point of view, um, there are a couple of ways you can think yourself around it. One is you can become self-conscious about it. A second is that you can study history because what you see in history is that context always changes. Um, but from the point of view of someone whose experience is not captured by the context, in the case of gender, that would be women, I think Peggy's answer is the right one. That is, there, that um, we find ourselves in a double bind. We have an answer that is stipulated by our social practices. And at the same time, we have an experience that rebels against those social practices. And so it's always necessary to keep thinking about social change in two different ways, to think about it, first of all, in terms of what we would like to achieve, but more importantly, as Peggy says, to acknowledge the double bind and to recognize that we change our, um, we, we seek to achieve change by um, taking half measures and half steps. And I, I, you're scowling, Peggy, but I hope that- no, no, I don't see a different way to do it. Yeah, I, I think that's right. So um, that's, that theme, I think, is present in Frank Garcia's question, who says, well, what do you do about, I mean, we are no longer in a homogeneous social context. And so what do you do about that? I mean, and, and in a sense, I think um, some of the um, conflicts that are described in, in constitutional law today by, by Greg um, are in that same category. What do we do about the fact that um, 
the, the social context is not uniform, that people have different understandings, that two people can very much think they're right and yet come to different conclusions and so forth. And I think the only way to deal with that is to be very clear about pulling out from the framework the assumptions that make for legal rulings. And that will sometimes mean that we don't just pull out the assumptions about the case at hand, we pull out the assumptions about human nature and the nature of society that, that inform the various resolutions of the case. Um, which is one of the reasons why I think Holmes was ahead of his time and absolutely right in seeing laws connected to human experience. Um, that unless we become self-conscious about that fact, um, we will be unable to move law into a new iteration. Um, I often, I, the, people talk about legal education as, as teaching law students to question the assumptions that are made when cases are decided. And what I'm advocating here is a much more rigorous examination of the assumptions to go back, not just to um, what did the judge assume about the nature of the plaintiff's claim, but what is the judge assume about the value of work and about women's role in society or about um, the, the importance of equality or any of those things. Those things need to be brought out as well. Um, in terms of, of Scott's comments, I admired them very much. I will say this. First of all, I totally agree with him that, um, that Holmes's uh, statement, which contrasts logic and experience, has had a terrible effect on American law. Now, I would say that's because people have not understood Holmes very well. And I think Scott would say, well, it's maybe because Holmes made some mistakes. So uh, we'll leave that disagreement where it is. But um, I did a lot of thinking about logic when I wrote this book. I even managed to put my hands on the logic book that Peirce and James and, and Holmes I'll learn logic from in college. Uh, but I didn't think of doing what Scott did, which I think is brilliant, which is to separate out these very five senses of logic. Um, and I want to think more about that and how that might help my argument become clearer. Um, the stability question that you asked at the end, Scott, I think um, in some way touches on this thing that I'm talking about, which is the importance of context and how much context does. Um, so in my book, I say that um, Holmes's decisions are models of a dialogue between form and substance. That is, um, he'll ask a formal question um, and answer it and then pick up a substantive question and then answer that and move on. Um, and I know that Scott doesn't like that because it sort of suggests that um, law uh, has this sort of loosey-goosey thing where it all depends on uh, where you start and where you finish and, and all of that. Um, but I do think there's more stability in law and I think that Scott is absolutely right when he says that. And I think the stability does come from the kinds of things that Scott talks about. There is in law, not just the legal rules, but there is a kind of discourse. Um, there's the discourse of doctrine. There's the discourse of various kinds of theories. There's the discourse that Scott mentioned about classical versus romantic. Um, there are lots of discourses in law and they all become relevant. Law as it goes on co-ops all these discourses and they become, they form the background of what judges and law students and lawyers think about when they look at legal questions. Um, my di difference with Scott would only be this, that um, when you look at the centuries of the common law, the millennia of the common law, um, what you see is all kinds of fads in these discourses. Discourses come and go. There was no such thing as contract theory in 1880. Um, until Langdell started talking about it, just wasn't there. Um, and the same thing is true I, if you read cases from the 19th century, you realize how much of their discourse is foreign to us. And so I think that one of the things that are really adequate pragmatic theory of law would do is to really look with some precision and, and the kind of um, uh, definiteness that Scott brings to the the table um, at these various forms of discourse and in their interrelationship with law. That was the best I could do in eight minutes. <laughs>
I'm sorry to press you to, to finish at seven on these um, short author meets critic panels. We want to just go away and read the book to get the rest of it. Let me thank you, Professor Wells, uh, for your wonderful book. Congratulate you on it and thank yeah. all of the panelists for, for their mention, words. Yeah. Yeah. The book is actually coming out in paperback in December and oh. it will be a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's a, a kind of book that you could probably find a Kindle version soon, but it's very nice, can I say, to read on paper. But all right. Um, well, thank you all again for, for contributing all of these thoughts. Um, it's a very rich text. And, uh, and thank you to the audience, too, for your questions. We'll say good night. Good night.